ladies and gentlemen, it is my, my privilege, sorry, and an absolute pleasure to bring to you uh, your next speaker. This gentleman is a legend in his own right. He's been a professional screenwriter since 1992. He's got films like Abdrofa, Ghulam, The Legend of Bhagat Singh, uh, Rajnithi to his name. Like, you know, this gentleman for 12 years has also served as the honorary head of the screenplay writing department, which he designed and created at FD2 Pune in uh, about 2014. Um, I could go on and on and on and on because, quite frankly, this man's credentials are about as long as my arm, longer than my arm, and I've got very long arms. Um, but what I want is for you guys to show some love, some appreciation, in fact, a lot of love and appreciation as I welcome up our next speaker who's going to be talking about the power of stories as catalysts for growth. So please join me in very warmly welcoming the man, the legend. Mr. Anjum Rajavali. Good morning. Uh, it is, uh, everyone has said this earlier and bears their vision. It's, it's a huge privilege to stand here and sort of address people who are such veteran and such experienced educators. Okay. It is we who should be listening to you people. Actually, but it so happens that this event has been arranged in such a way that there is some kind of sharing from our side which should take place. I am not really as qualified or as experienced as you know, most of you here, but yes, I have been doing a bit of teaching for the last 14 years or so. It was also quite a privilege and a pleasure to listen to Dr. Chandrasekhar just now. And I think the focus that he gave of his talk has sort of really got my own mind journey. This morning has been actually quite a striking experience. First time I was traveling in the bus with two ladies. One is principal of the school, the other was a counselor, I mean, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, career counselor. And we got into a spontaneous conversation. And underlying all the other things that they were saying, there was saying there was a sense of arms, there was a sense of concern bordering on distress about the environment that they saw around us. And I'm not only referring to what is happening around us here, I mean here as in sorry, India, but also the world. Third thing that comes in when I'm passing through the corridor and there is the Aristotelian saying which says that if you educate only the mind and not the heart, then that is no education. And it's capped with what Dr. Kanshir was saying, that education for a better collective future. He used key words like making a better human being, making a better citizen. He talked about cultural diversity. He talked about shaping a joint future. He used words like cross-national, cross-cultural. And this, I feel, is actually what I would like to sort of share my thoughts about. As a, an educator, so to say, it's a very big word, as well as as a story writer and a general parent and a citizen. I mean, I'm going to go directly to the point. And I'm going to pull no punches because I will say what I feel from the heart. It is perhaps the most challenging time in the recent times that we have been facing on the On the one hand, while there seems to be this enormous emphasis <coughs> on growth, 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 because everybody wants growth, and growth is measured, unfortunately, as in economic growth. Growth is measured as how much sort of economic progress you are able to make, how much of financial leverage you have. And on the other hand, we see the kind of complete exclusivity in our approach that we are finding. As human beings, we are turning into islands where lines are drawn so clearly, where we are constantly feeling that differences between people are antagonistic. Differences create suspicion, they create hostility. Where we are unable to actually reconcile to the other constantly creating an other which actually is a threat and as a result of which we are legitimating violence. 
In India, we've been going through some very trying times. All of us are aware of that. I mean, the most recent case comes out of a film, for God's sake. I mean, it's a film based on a myth created by a, a poet in the 16th century. And the country is effectively up in flames. People are using violence to try and stop that. I mean, cornerstones of the constitution, like freedom of expression, don't seem to hold any value at all. Supreme Court orders are being violated. Buses which carry school children are being stolen. And we are mute witnesses just in our distress. And that distress and arms was being reflected through these two sensitive individuals that I was having a conversation with in the bus. So all of us seem to be feeling that. And it's across the world. So where do we come in as teachers, as educators? What is our intervention here? What is our response, as Dr. Chandrasekhar so eloquently sort of brought his whole thing to Okay, this is the premise. This is the situation. This is the scenario and the challenge. So where do we enter? What is our response to this? And this is where I wanted to bring in the topic of my thing. I mean, it says catalyst for growth, but I couldn't think of any other phrase. I thought, okay, let me try and go from growth to actually humanity. So for a moment, discard that. If they keep playing it, it will keep hammering you, so I wish they'd stop playing that. Why are stories so eternally important? Why is it that ever since human beings began communicating with each other, that stories have always been the most universal, the most common means of communication in every society? Why is it that children are so naturally, spontaneously insistent, cannot tell me a story, otherwise I won't go to sleep? I mean, bedtime stories have all become part of an accepted routine where it, 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 it is true, children grow up on stories. What is so attractive about that? And I'm going to say two things here you know, from also the practitioner's point of view. <clears throat> Forgive my throat, I mean, I've been having some trouble. Life is full of so much of contradiction. Life is full of so much of arbitrary, random, un-understandable events which keep taking place. Life doesn't always make sense. And it's not meant to make sense. And you find friendships of, you know, lifelong friendships, maybe people have been together as best friends for like last 30 years, inseparable, turning into bitter enemies. You find happy marriages and childhood sweethearts after having 14 years of a very, very fulfilling life together, suddenly getting into a bit of a divorce. It doesn't make sense. We feel like aisa hota hai, aisa hota hai. Stories come in there where they question these phenomena. Because the aim of stories is to take such a close look at the human condition to help us make sense out of life. And which is why children get so attracted towards that, because stories are formulated using the trigger of life experiences, whether they come from reality or whether they come from imagination, both of them are real experiences. So they're formulated in such a way, that's what we try to do, in such a way that it becomes a meaningful experience, number one. And the second factor which I want to bring in here is that stories are where we lose ourselves in the world that the author has created, and we develop a relationship with characters who we don't necessarily agree with in life, who we would never have a conversation with. So here the point is that they help us to build an empathy with those characters, with characters that we disagree with. And what Harpali said, I mean Harpali who wrote that wonderful book, uh, How to Kill, I mean, um, How to Kill a Mockingbird, To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm sorry, yeah, my son is correcting me there. To Kill a Mockingbird, where she says, that you will never understand the other person until you are able to see it from his point of view. Stories help us to do that. They help us to relate to characters who we would never ever agree with in life, never have a conversation with, never have a dialogue or a relationship with. But they help us to relate to those characters and see that character's point of view. And this expands our capacity for empathy and compassion. Stories make 
society is more compassionate. You want to destroy a society, take the story away. Make, force the artist to self-censor. Force the artist, the storyteller, to actually be anxious about how his story will be received and you are effectively destroying the society. You are effectively killing the very basis of education. Because the basis of education, as Dr. Sanchez says, allow and encourage the child to explore. Story is held in the I'll give you an example from real life. Even though my son might be embarrassed about it. I have been a very keen uh, student and a very keen lover of my father. I mean, the two favorite stories of mine and of, I think, all of you, of course, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. There cannot be a better story than that. I mean, I'm familiar with Greek mythology and there are great stories there and other mythology also, but well, my relationship with these two is like, like, of, of, then I'm, then I'm getting so what is it that is so attractive about these two? Is it because it's a religious text? It's not a religious text at all. It has nothing to do with religion. Is it a prescriptive text as is being made out to be that learn to live like Ram? You will never be able to. Is it because there is that we need to worship these characters? No, I don't believe in worship. I'm an atheist. And I have said it from public platform. I do not subscribe to any religion at all. Much as I'm born a Muslim in a Muslim family, fair enough. What the Mahabharata particularly will give that example, brings home to us, and I'm relating it to education. What the Mahabharata brings home to us is that all these characters, whether they stand on the side of Dharma, whether they stand on the side of the Kauravas, the point is all these are human characters which are flawed and full of contradictions. There is no character in the Mahabharata which doesn't have a flaw. Not Arjun, not Yudhishthir, not Draupadi, not Kunti, not Pandu, not Bhishma, not at all. None of them. So it brings home to us that you have a relationship with these characters, you are also able to recognize that they are battling their own contradictions, as are all human beings. And the point is that these stories make us understand that point of view. I was narrating a particular incident, the most, most dreadful incident of, of, of any story. I'm referring to Draupadi's humiliation in the Salah. I mean, the worst kind of thing that could possibly have happened. So I was about two and a half years old, he may not even sort of distinctly remember that. And I was narrating it in a childlike way so that he could understand it, the good people, the bad people. Hoping that that interest will grow into him reading mythology further. But fortunately, he did. So he did actually read further, more adult texts. And we came to this horrible humiliation which takes place. He was stunned. He sat up in bed. Unfortunately, it happened to be bedtime that when that incident occurred. But I didn't pull my punches. And I explained to him what had happened. And I didn't say that Krishna sent. Bundle of saris to the Kavatara because that is not what happened at all. She was actually humiliated, she was disrobed, and she was menstruating at that time. And he was very keen to know what the good people in that Sabha were doing. And I ticked off Desh Drawn and how they were quibbling about, you know, what is the rule here and what's the law and did he take her first before he staked himself and what's the implications of that? Some rubbish. All these men were hiding behind. And his one question was, what was Karn doing? Because Karn was his hero. Karn is, you know, full of valor, tan, he is sure, he is, what was Karn doing? And I had to break the bad news to him that Karn actually encouraged it. He was shocked at that time. I don't know whether he remembers, he was shocked. He said, but how could that happen? You told me Karn was a good person. I said, well, this is your first lesson in the human condition, that good people are capable of doing bad things. And he couldn't understand it fully at that time. Later on, of course, we discussed envy, we discussed deprivation, we discussed his pain, his anger, and how it came out against this. Now, the point here is this, that If we were to integrate 
And I'm not using it as a description, I'm merely using it as really coming out of anguish, so sort of suggestion that I'm making. If we were to in integrate storytelling and stories, and particularly ancient stories, if we were to actually delink those things from the patriarchal propaganda which has been thrown at us, that these are the stories, these ancient stories are the stories of the heroic men and how the women were weak and they were docile and they were domesticated and whenever they stepped out of line they created trouble, they were victims to be saved. There were reasons for men to show their valor because their opposite was humiliated and therefore they had to have a war to avenge his honor. It was nothing of the kind at all. If we were to take away that sheen of the popular versions, which is a patriarchal version which has been handed down to us, we discovered that the same kind of dilemmas that we are facing today there is enormous gender violence which we are witnessing all over the place. Human beings are finding a very, very hard time to actually establish an equilibrium within themselves between the two genders, between masculinity and femininity. We are, this, we are looking at how difficult it is to reconcile differences. We are looking at how we are creating sort of as I said, an exclusivist approach, that nationalism, which seems to be the new buzzword, unfortunately we have distorted the word nationalism actually to mean nationalism is hatred of the other. Patriotism, we have taken love out of patriotism. Patriotism is love for your people. Whereas here there is some conceptual notion of what, what the country means. Which doesn't seem to include its people. Which doesn't seem to include the beautiful diversity of its people at all. Because that is what we hate. We love the country, but we hate its people. So these kind of notions which have been going around, stories are the one through, particularly through all these ancient stories, particularly through mythology, we realize that these are eternal questions. And they have been formulated in these stories in such a way that they actually bring to make sense to children. So, yeah, these, these dilemmas are there, I need to acknowledge that that dilemma is there within me, which was my point to him, that you think that you are a good person, well, I will detect in you, and I will help you to acknowledge that there are impulses in you which are violent, impulses against the very people who we love. And he actually, he won't even remember, related it once when, I mean, he, he gave me that example by saying that, yes, that is how I behaved with my mother. His mother was sort of depriving him of the second scoop of ice cream because his throat was, throat was giving trouble. And he was so fond of it, he wanted it. And he got so angry, he threw an imaginary kick her away. Children tend to do that. And he was very upset with himself. And he, at that time when I was talking about good people doing bad things, he was able to remember that. And I said, this is the contradiction that we need to face. We don't need to look at the other person and say, that person is bad, these people are bad, the Muslims are bad, the Hindus are bad, the Dalits are bad. We need to look inward and slowly help us to do that. When Dr. Chandrasekhar said that we need to change the original definition of education, that instead of bringing out the best in oneself, we need to make it, give it a more collective thing. I'm going to have a slight sort of difference with you in here. In here. But I say that bringing out the best in yourself is also bringing out the best in your capacity for empathy. Your capacity, your ability to live with differences. Your capacity of being able to relate to the other without necessarily agreeing with the person. Because the purpose of relationships or even of any communication is not to convince the other person of your point of view, but to understand the other person's point of view. And we seem to have moved away from that in society. We seem to feel that if you disagree with me, that I'm with me, that I'm afraid of you, I will destroy you. I will make sure that you do not speak that. So the whole, whole bedrock of this civilization, which is based on Mata Gandhi's bhajan, which we always play on the 30th of Jan, Vaishnava Janna to Tene Kahiye Pir Parai Janere. A true human being is one who is able to recognize and feel the pain of the other. That is what makes us human beings. And this is our heritage. This is what sort of, this is what 5,000 or more years of civilization have actually given us, which we are in danger of losing. And I fear for the future generation if this is the kind of hostile atmosphere in which they are coming up, thinking that this is, it is legitimate. I feel stories as interventions perhaps would help them to take a wiser, a closer, a more sensitive, a more responsible, a more compassionate look at 
fact that difficulty is not relationship, but it very many are different. And, and perhaps understanding what half a talks about, that you will not be able to understand the other until you seek from his point of view. Stories make us do that. They make my child seek Karl's point of view also, not that you have to agree with that. You see, Ravan's point of view, if you read the original Valmiki Ravan, if you read, I mean, that there was a dimension to him which was superbly heroic. And you have to remember, and you women will appreciate that he didn't lay a finger on Sita. He said, if you want me, I will have you. Please, why can't you want me? So, that there is this complexity everywhere, that nobody has to be painted in this stereotypical black and white way. And education exactly is what brings home this complexity to us. That explore, to understand, not necessarily to agree, to not to homogenize us, as Dr. Chandrasekhar pointed out. Education doesn't mean that through a regimented process we homogenize the entire thing and make them skilled workers for industry. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense which has been fed down to us. And a lot of us seem to have accepted in our generation it was that. The fear of failure is what education, unfortunately, the system has brought home to us in our generation. It was an anxiety about failure. It robs us of creativity, what you were emphasizing so much. The moment you fear that, the moment you are judged competitively, the moment your parent tells you, Tum first number me hai, Tum sara 17th number hai, but what is it that he is about? What is it that he is learning about life as a human being? Is it helping him to discover what he is about and what he or she likes? Then let's focus on that instead of how you stood compared to the first person in class. A fish is meant to swim in the stream, not climb a tree. You can't compare a fish to a monkey. So to recognize differences and that differences are good. Individuality is good. Peculiarity is a good thing. It makes us sort of potentially, it, 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 it makes us learned people. And I think stories constantly bring home to us. And I cannot thank my luck enough to have been born in a country where the stories are everywhere, except in classrooms. <laughs> we, we, we give lip service to the fact that stories are a great way of teaching, a great way of education, and yet we don't seem to use those. We don't seem to encourage, we feel the okay if you're doing STEM or whatever it is that you're talking about, that this is science, this is humanity, this is the two of separate things. How can it be like that? A human being has to have a certain component of personal narratives. A human being is supposed to grow up creating stories about the world because that is how he'll make sense out of it. That is how she will make life more meaningful. And we have a treasure. We have millions of folk tales. We have hundreds of versions of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and all of them are living texts. We don't need to stick to something that this is purest. It goes against the very, very cornerstone of what Mahabharata is about. It's the world. We have a treasure chest, you just dip your hand in and pull anything out, it's gold. Where do you find that? Do you find that in the most developed capitalist country in the world, in America? I mean, they destroyed their indigenous civilization. They destroyed the narratives, the traditions which were there. So now they believe that, okay, America was created in 1776. No, America was already there. Columbus discovered America. What? Are you serious? It was already there. So they destroyed it, so now maybe they're thrashing about with a certain collective anxiety bombing every country in the world. So I don't know anyway, I'm not sort of going to veer off into my personal sort of uh, you know, grief against <laughs> what certain countries are doing. But I want us to emphasize this. I want us to sort of take a real look at literally just mythology, nothing else. Forget broad stories and literature, all those are very big words. Just simple mythology. If our children grow up on that, they will have a closer and a more compassionate relationship with life and with you. That's all I want.